You know, I have uh, found myself in a Romanian cultural context on so many occasions, and even hearing, listening, learning uh, just a word here or there, uh, a pace, Dumnezeu uh, se ta binecuvânteze, even those small phrases, have they were a great challenge to me. I find other languages for some reason, even even African languages that have like clicks and and unique uh, things came a little bit easier. And I would I would be um, I would be paying attention during worship and reading the lines on the screen, hearing it pronounced next to me, and it seemed like the language could not be unlocked. And I used to say everywhere I would travel to in the Romanian community, uh, if I could if I could choose the language of choice for the moment, I would order food in Italian because. Spaghetti. It just sounds better when you say it with an Italian accent. I don't know. You know, you speak maybe romantically in French. I would sing in Spanish or Portuguese. I would argue in maybe Arabic. I don't know. And uh, I would uh, I would pray in Romanian. It seems like a language that was meant for prayer. It seems like uh, almost that if uh, you know if you want to speed dial heaven, you pray in Romanian. And so the last time I was here, I, I asked Pastor Christie, I said, would you help me? I will write out a prayer in English if you could translate it. And, and so you're not putting words in my mouth, but it's something from my heart. And then I will listen to an audio recording and try to work on it. I don't do it to be some kind of performer. Um, I just understand that people who, who come and uh, find themselves in, in multiple cultures, the culture of uh, your parents, your grandparents, and then a culture here, that there is so much effort that goes into navigating multiple cultures and how, um, how arrogant it would be for someone to come into your midst on multiple occasions and not put forth some effort to try to bridge that gap as well. And so the prayer that I gave, Pastor Christie, would you stand with him to your feet? I'll pray and then we will read God's word. I will say that after learning just this short prayer that I found to be very difficult and I played it over and over, maybe maybe well over a hundred times, listening and pronouncing and listening and pronouncing, it seemed that since then, the language has been unlocked a little bit more. I'm, I'm sitting in services and hearing preachers preach and I can pick up on a few more things than I did before and uh, I honor your culture. And I know that the, the effort of this church is to reach a generation who doesn't speak the old language as much, and yet I still find value in it. Father, we invite you to come and fill this place with your presence today. You are good, you are powerful, you are holy. Anoint us to receive power from you today in Jesus' name and for your glory. Tata te chemam asta sa vishi sa umpli acest loc presenza ta. Yest bun, yest puternic, tu yest sfunt. Un gene astăzi să primim de la tine putere în numele lui Isus doar pentru slava ta. Amin. Would you remain standing as we read God's word? If you find that my pronunciation sounds like a little bit of a, a Bucharest accent, it's because I learned it from Pastor Christie. Praise the Lord. How many know we carry the accent of the ministries that we are under? Amen. I pray that you have the accent of the leadership of this house. Can I say that, well, let me first say that October is considered to be Pastor's Appreciation Month. And you say, well, that's, a, that's an American thing. I don't know if it's an American thing or not. I know it's a demonic and devil thing to unappreciate the pastor the other 11 months of the year. So it's a godly thing to take one month and appreciate the leadership that God has for you. Amen. I was raised in churches where we called everybody brother and sister. Even the pastor, we called them, uh, you know, brother. But, but the Bible says in James that you should not quickly desire to be a teacher because those who are raised in leadership, they will be judged more harshly. And if these men of God and those in leadership will stand to give an account for your soul, then they're not just your brother. They are pastor. It doesn't mean that somebody has designated them and some organization has said so. It means that they are willing to give an account for your soul and that is worthy of more than just brother and sister. It also means that wherever Jesus was not honored, 
it didn't offend him he knew who he was he didn't need them to call him prophet in order to bolster his his confidence and self-esteem he already knew he was a prophet and yet because they did not honor who he was it said he could not do many mighty works in Capernaum because they said isn't this just Mary and Joseph's son we saw him grow up in the neighborhood we know this guy for a long time who missed out Jesus or the people the people and so honor is not you don't somehow diminish your leadership by refusing to honor them in a greater way you actually diminish yourself and you miss out I honor the leadership of this house because I don't know the, the membership of this, of this uh, Passion for Christ Church, but I can tell you it is not run like a church of 100 or 200 people. It is run like a church of several thousand people. There is excellence in everything. I've not been to this church one time. That It's only been in three-month increments, and every time I come, there is, there is uh, um, upgrades, work that's being done. Amen. I thank for the upgrade of that espresso machine. Come on. Amen. That's an upgrade. Amen. Y'all stay awake better since y'all got that machine. Not many of y'all are sleeping in my preaching anymore. Thank God for upgrades. Why? Because we're not a little cloistered community that says as long as our four and no more make it to heaven, we'll be glad. No, we want everyone that will call on the name of the Lord. And so the leadership has, has, has endeavored to say let's operate with excellence. And yet not as an organization to say if we get the business strategy right, then the numbers will follow. We have to do God's business with excellence, but God's business also requires prayer and fasting. And so while we have excellence in a espresso machines and excellence and media and cameras and people my sister my sister in Florida watches these services because she likes to hear me preach and when she looks on YouTube and is scrolling through evangelist Robert Martin she sees the excellence of the camera and the media quality of this church and says I'll listen to him preach there amen amen excellence in the things of the practical but a great intentionality in the things of the spirit that doesn't happen on accident. I know you're standing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, and then in a moment you'll be seated, and I'll stand for the next three hours while I preach. So I get the award for standing the longest this morning. Well, that was an exaggeration. The Lord knows my heart. Matthew 23 and 4 says, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Jesus is condemning the Pharisees' ministry, if you will, and saying you put heavy burdens on people and you do not lift a finger to help them. Matthew 23 and verse 13 and then verse 15 says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye that they enter, that, that suffer ye them that are entering in to go in. Verse 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye can pass land and sea to make one proselyte, one disciple, one more follower, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. John chapter 8 and verse 3. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Two more verses, Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 7. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain. He shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace. 
I didn't give this verse to the media team, but John chapter one and verse 16, and of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. Before you're seated, look at your neighbor and say, grace on you. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Praise the Lord. Some of you will have to remember back to what it was like to be in school, but in most classrooms and in most grade levels, you could divide the class into two categories, rule keepers and rule breakers. Who were the rule keepers in the room? Can I see your hand? Come on. Goody two shoes, brought the apple to the teacher, straight A's. Can I clean the chalkboard for you? We don't even have chalkboards, you know, dry erase boards, you know what I mean. Okay, where, where, where's, the peop, where's the rule breakers? Come on, let me see your hand. Amen, amen. I love it. Even ministers and missionaries here saying, I didn't always, <laughs> amen. And you, you know what rule breakers love to do? They love to sit in the back of the bus, the back of the class, and they love to, to jab their friend, and they love to say, hey, watch this. And then they, they you know, shoot a, an, a paper, paper plane, or they, they do something to, to get a laugh out of the class, always trying to instigate trouble to be some form of entertainment. Rule keepers and rule breakers. Do you know how I know this book was not originated in the minds of men but in the minds of God because the people who wrote this book did some stuff that they are guilty of and God made them put it in there okay young people you need to close your ears because I'm about to I'm about to tell you something that happened in the Bible your parents don't want you to know this but when you read the Bible and you hear things like Jacob kissed Rachel on the first date you're like uh uh that's, that's a rule breaker you're not allowed to kiss on the first date I know some of y'all like you're not even allowed to touch until you're married. Not pinky fingers. Don't even look in her direction. Just let your parents arrange it. That's the will of God. I don't know what your rule is on that. You, you find rule breakers. You find people like David. David who was hungry, who went to the tabernacle and asked Abiathar for something to eat. And they said, we don't have any bread here except for the, the show bread, the, the sacred bread that's only for the priest. And, and he says, but if, you're, if your soldiers haven't, haven't laid with women, if they're consecrated, here, let them have it. That's, that's against the rules. How did that get in the book? You find over and over the people of God, God even giving them grace when they were not perfect and then you come into the new testament and you find jesus i mean he he kept the law he is the fulfillment of the law and yet that doesn't necessarily mean he kept all the rules of men's religion you know there are, are hasidic jews to this day orthodox jews to this day that have added rules upon rules so like on shabbat on the sabbath you're not supposed to plow they have added to that rule that if you need to spit on the Sabbath, you must spit on a rock or on concrete because if you spit in the dirt and it moves the dirt, you have plowed on the Sabbath and so you've broken the law if you spit in dirt on the Sabbath. That's a rule of men. You're not allowed to bear a burden and carry a weight on the Sabbath. So they have added to that rule that if you wear false teeth, you're not allowed to wear your false teeth on Shabbat from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. If you got false teeth in here, how many are you grateful you're not a Hasidic Jew? I'm grateful. <laughs> I'd rather see the fake ones when you smile than none at all. You add things and until they, the, the scribes and Pharisees, they're always pointing out at Jesus. Your, 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 uh, your disciples didn't wash their hand. He said, you wash the outside of the cup and the inside is, is disease. The inside of you, you you're, you're whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. Every time they're accusing, you're, look at you, you're, you're commanding, you're, but, but then I see Jesus almost like this person that's just stirring up trouble. You know, I have a question. Don't actually give me the answer. It's, it's, but, but think about it yourself. Did Jesus ever heal on any other day than the Sabbath? Because it seems like everything that got into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John says, and it being the Sabbath, Jesus was in the synagogue and saw a man with a withered hand, saw a woman who was bent over for 18 years. I can almost see him in the back of the synagogue ribbing J Peter, James, and John and saying, watch this. 
I'm not breaking God's law, but I'm about to break their rule. Oh, they're about to get so mad. What did just heal her tomorrow? Jesus? No, I don't want to heal her tomorrow. I want to heal her on the day that's going to mess up their system. You with a withered hand. I'm not healing you over in the corner. Get in the middle of everybody. Watch this, guys. Stretch out your hand. Be made whole. You're not allowed to do this on the Sabbath. They even accuse the, they even accuse the disciples for picking heads of grain while they're walking through a field and, and, and saying, you're not allowed to pick grain on the Sabbath. Jesus says, have you not read that David took the showbread that was not to eat? He said, you have made Sabbath the Lord of men. He said, it's not made to be a burden. You make everything a burden. You make everything too heavy. You don't lift a finger to, to lighten the load. You cross land and sea to make somebody more like you. And when they're like you, they're twice full the child of hell. You don't go in and you block the way from them going in also. You know, if you read through the gospels and you begin to understand how often these, these rule keepers come against Jesus, you almost begin to see them as the villains. Jesus is the hero. Scribes and Pharisees, bad guys. And you're reading as a child, you know, you're reading the Gospels and you're saying, yay, Jesus. And then you get to the Pharisees and you say, boo, bad guys. You just see the word and you're like, oh, that's a bad guy. Oh, well, Nicodemus, he's about to transition from being a bad guy to a good guy. Oh, Paul was a bad guy. He was a Saul of Tarsus. He was a bad guy. He was a villain. Now he's a good guy because he's a follower of Jesus. But we don't understand that there's something deeper in those trying to keep the law. One thing I love about the, the, the power of God's miracles, if I could drop this on you just for a moment, it may not bless you, but it blesses me, is that God desires so much to pour out his power amongst us that he will suspend the laws of nature in order to give you a miracle. He'll make water stand up like a wall for Moses and then crash down to destroy the enemies of Israel. He'll make the sun stand still in the valley of Aijalon for Joshua. Amen. He'll make fire fall out of heaven for Elijah. He is a God that says, I created the laws of gravity and I will suspend the laws of gravity for not only me to walk on water, but for Peter to come and fellowship with me on this water. He made the laws that govern the universe. And you know why that's important? Because there's a devil that tries to tell you and me the thing that you're believing God for wanting God to do praying to God about the devil says it's too far gone it's impossible for your spouse to get saved it's impossible for your children to be to be delivered from their addiction how many times have they tried to do better and they go back again it's too far the enemy wants to say it seems illegal it seems that there is a trespass law that they cannot come back into the family of God or the kingdom of God or the will of God that it would be illegal for you to operate in your anointing or in your ministry let me tell you if he made the sun stand still for Joshua if he shut the mouths of lions for Daniel if he made water like a wall for Moses he will make the law of the devil turn around God will break the law of natural things in order to give you a miracle if you think about it every miracle is the suspended law of nature for God to perform something that we never earn or deserve it is his grace and his mercy hallelujah the reason the Pharisees became this legalistic is because 470 years I believe something like that Israel was in a process of backsliding God prophesies through Isaiah through Jeremiah he says, you've not honored Sabbath years of letting the land grow fallow and you've been plowing every year without giving it a Sabbath year. You've profaned the Sabbath day. You've profaned the name of the Lord. You've taken it in vain. You've, you've bowed down to idols. You've, you've done all these things. And so for this, I will send you into Babylon for 70 years. Now hear me, you gotta hear me today. This is not a bedtime story. This is not a fable or mythology. Somebody say, it really happened. So the Bible says that when they were carried into Babylon, their babies were dashed against stones. The wombs of, of expecting mothers were ripped open. Men that went off to war came, did not come home and families were bereaved of sons and of fathers. They went, they went as slaves. They went. It was a great traumatic moment when they were carried into Babylon. And there they stayed for 70 years. It's one of the Psalms says while we were there by the river in Babylon they wanted us to sing a song of Zion 
And we said, how will we sing a song in this desperate wilderness land? Psalm 91, he says, if I forget the old Jerusalem, let my hand forget its cunning. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. The Bible doesn't say this, but Jewish historians say that when they were taken into Babylon, they made the blacksmiths of Israel work as blacksmiths in, in Babylon. They made, the, they made every tradesperson like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego work in a place of value in Babylon. And so they took the singers and the musicians and they said, you used to play in Jerusalem at your temple. Now you will play for our gods in our temple and the Bible doesn't say this but historians have said that what Psalm 91 is referring to is that the Israelites took their own musicians and broke their fingers took their singers and cut out their tongues and said we would rather be mute we would rather be crippled than be forced to sing and worship a foreign god I think that there's some significance to that in our generation that we have people that claim to be Christian and can listen to secular music. Listen to the music of people that are backslidden Pentecostal preachers kids like the Jonas Brothers, like Katy Perry, people that were raised in Pentecostal homes that backslid and are not singing to the glory of God on these stages, but are singing to the glory of the flesh, the world, and the devil on the stages of this world and say, well, I can worship God on Sunday and still listen to that mess the rest of the week. Friend, you got to make up your mind if you're going to be lukewarm or if you're going to burn for Jesus. The historian said, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, let my hand forget its cut. I will worship no foreign God. In that Babylonian exile, there was a repentance. Ezekiel prophesying. In that Babylonian exile, there was a returning. There was a revival in their hearts. And so some of the people, some of the leadership said, we never want this to happen again. So we must make sure we keep the law and not only to keep the law to prevent this trauma from occurring again, hear me, but also to be found worthy that the Messiah would come and set up the throne of David in an eternal kingdom where Israel will be the center of the world and, and, the, and, the, and the Messiah will rule forever. They acquainted their obedience to the law of Moses to the point that they had herb gardens. Jesus says you tithe on mint, cumin, and anise. Think of a little mint bush outside the window of your kitchen. And you, you take 10 leaves. And every 10th leaf, you put it aside to tithe to the temple. I'm not saying that that's not pleasing to the Lord. However, Jesus said, the weightier matters of love and mercy and justice, you left off those things. In order to keep laws thinking that these things, systems, would save you. I felt the Lord direct me this morning to, to come and bring to your attention the same thing that our brother, Brother Joe Bueca, just shared with us. You know, Brother Joe, where are you at? You know, you, you had me feeling bad for you. You said, I'm not a good speaker. I'm not very dynamic. I was like, oh, God, help him. Poor little guy, he probably doesn't. And then you brought an anointing. I was like, come on, that's good. Feed us some more. I'm gonna use that from now on. I'm gonna get up and get everybody to really lower their expectations. I don't really know what I'm doing. Just pray for me. And then they'll be, they'll expect so little. They'll be like, wow, I love that word. Amen, the grace of God, amen. Does it take work for salvation? Yes, but the work was done by Christ alone. I, amen. Pastor Semi in uh, in uh, Pastor Semi in um, uh, Michigan in Detroit. He said, "Anything you put before the cross to get to Jesus is legalism, but whatever you put after the cross as an act of worship to the Lord, that is worship. That is not legalism." I mean, in one sentence, that man of God taught me something I've been trying to figure out all my life. Isn't that good? Praise the Lord. Let's go to lunch. We're done. That's all I needed to tell you. <laughs> Amen. So what happens is that when people experience something tragic in their life, as they try to find how their behavior can make sure that never happens again, it, does, it, it works like this. During the Great Depression in the United States, we had a, we had a famine throughout the, the breadbasket of the Midwest where, where corn and wheat is grown, and so that... That was devastating the, the availability of food. And then there was a, 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 a crash in the stock market. And so that was affecting the economy. And what ended up happening is that people were eating 
the, 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 anything they could find. And so people like my grandmother, my grandfather, their generation, they ate things I do not eat. I, do, I don't know what, I don't know what a chicken gizzard is, but it doesn't sound good. I don't know what it is about your, your uh, culture, but when somebody says, I don't think I like that, you think, well, I'll show him. I'll find the best recipe of chicken gizzards. I'll make him eat it, and I'll show him I'm such a good cook. I even make chicken gizzards taste good. That's not what I'm asking for. This was not a challenge to your cooking skills. They ate the intestines of, of pigs and cows, and, and they ate livers. And some of y'all, don't, don't preach against livers. Livers is good. Maybe livers is good for you. I'm not interested in eating livers. They took stale cornbread that was too hard to bite on and they put it in buttermilk until it softened and they would eat it with a spoon. What happens is years later, that generation, when they need something just to comfort their soul, you know what they want? Chicken livers, chicken gizzards, uh, a tripe, which is cow intestines, and they say, give me some cornbread and put it in some buttermilk, mama. That's what I really want to eat right now. What? What happened? You had to eat pig's feet because the rest of the pig was gone. The bacon was gone. We don't have to eat pig's feet anymore. <laughs> I can see I'm offending some people. We love pickled fit pig's feet where we come from. I don't know if you do. I'm sorry. Just, brother, take the microphone. I'm done. I can see they're mad at me now. <laughs> I don't know what you pickle. I don't know what you love, what your specialty is, but hear me. You don't have, this is what happens. There's a whole generation that came out of the depression and says, I remember when we didn't have much food. And so now I finish everything on my plate and they raise their children. You have to finish everything on, their pl on your plate. Now hear me. If you leave five peas on your plate, that has nothing to do with the stock market in New York City. There's no correlation. So then why make a law to finish everything on your plate? Because it makes you feel better emotionally that if I finish what's on my plate, then I'm showing gratitude to what I have. Therefore, we won't go back into a depression again. Do you see how we create a law and we say, if I don't cross these boundaries, I will build walls of safety around me. It took me a long time to realize, Mary, maybe these Pharisees and Sadducees weren't the villains. They weren't waking up every morning saying, well, we just, we hope we can ruin Jesus' day today. We hope 2,000 years from now, some little boy named Robert starts reading the Bible and says, well, there's the bad. That's not their desire. Their desire is our, our parents, our grandparents, our, our ancestors, they were refugees in a foreign land where such trauma came on them and we never want that pain again. Every generation wants to save the next generation of the pain they faced in the past. How many know that's true? But what can happen is that we can create laws in our life. Let me tell you the way this worked for me. My grandfather was a pastor, a mighty, mighty man of God. Strict, Oh, I think I've told you before, but let me just tell you again. Granny and granddaddy were so strict. My granny is 84 years old. She's never wore pants a day in her life. She, I've taken her with me preaching different places. And she said, you mind if I wear pajama pants to bed? I said, granny, I don't care what you wear to sleep. She wanted to make sure it wasn't going to offend me that she didn't wear a nightgown. I don't know. She's not trimmed her hair since she was 16 years old. Never a stitch of makeup on her face. Not only did they not wear any jewelry, granddaddy didn't wear a watch because it was like jewelry. They didn't have a television. And the radio they had, we listened to Adventures in Odyssey, preaching, and the news. That was the only thing that was played in their house. Somebody bought a Bible Pictionary board game. And I said, Granddaddy, would you play Bible Pictionary? He saw that to find whose turn it was, you had to roll dice. He said, no. No, dice belongs in Vegas. And that's gambling and that's sin. And I'm not going to be involved in anything that's going Bible Pictionary because there was dice involved. But he loved me. I never felt judged. I never felt hated. But I watched his life, his close walk with the God, 
Now, my mom, she was the piano player at our church. My dad was, was uh, I think, Sunday school superintendent, head of the Sunday school for a while. When I was, when I was three uh, and four years old, we didn't have a television because we went to their church and granddaddy preached against it. We had a piano, an upright piano in our living room. And we learned to sing as a family. And so I didn't know, I didn't know about uh, Santa or Superman or Spider-Man or Batman. I knew about the songs of the church. I, I have cassette tapes. You don't know what those are. Just go to a museum. It, I don't know how to explain it. But there was, I have cassette tapes of me, three years old, quoting the Lord's Prayer and quoting the hundredth song. You couldn't tell what I was saying because I was three, so I wasn't pronouncing very clearly. But I remember that's what, that, that was my life. And then my, my grandfather's church had a split. I know y'all don't know anything about, like that never happens in your community, but in American churches, sometimes people don't honor. Sometimes they get mad and they, they don't just leave peacefully. They throw stones. My mom and my dad got hurt by the way they were treating my grandfather and the disruption and the upheaval and they backslid. Everything in my life began to change. We never went to football games, baseball games, basketball games. We never went to those things and now we were going. We never had a TV and all of a sudden we had one. And not only did we have one, my dad got two VCRs so he could play one, cassette, one VCR and then recorded illegally onto another one so we could build our own library of movies and we could watch the same. I mean, we were catching up on everything he never watched his whole life. I remember the day my mom came home with her ears pierced. I was raised in the deep south where you don't question your parents. You don't say, why are you doing? You, we, you don't even ask, where are you going? You put on the clothes that your mother laid out and you find out when you get there. That's a, you never question. I was four years old and I didn't know what was happening. So I just walked in the backyard and cried. I was four and I knew this is not, none of the women in my family have their ears pierced. My sister, two years older than me, she begins to have nightmares that her and mama are going to hell because they're wearing pants. And it was, it was just three years later, my parents got a divorce. And you're, you're, you're thinking that what I'm saying is that those compromises led to their divorce. Hear me today. If that's your correlation, then you're saying earrings equal divorce. Pants equal divorce. All of those things were just a drifting from Jesus and from the house of God. It wasn't a drifting from rules and systems. My mom ended up working two jobs in order to pay her bills because she was now not in the combined income of home and her and my dad in the home. And so while she was working the second job, my sister and I would spend the afternoons with my grandfather. My grandmother was a caretaker for an elderly person. And so it was just me and granddaddy and sissy every afternoon. Well, I knew granddaddy wasn't going to play Bible Pictionary. I knew granddaddy wasn't going to, he wasn't going to, you know, talk about any, any cartoons. And if I wanted to connect with him, I had to talk to him about things he wanted to talk about. And so from 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, I sat in my grandfather's li living room and I said, talk to me about holiness. It was a word I heard him say a lot. He, bought, he brought a big Strong's Concordance that was held together by duct tape. You don't know about these things because you have Google, but you used to have to open a big book to find all the words in the Bible in alphabetical order. And I'm, I'm a little boy and he lays the Strong's Concordance in my lap and says, this is where you find the, the H words, go down to holiness and you open and you can read every verse in the whole Bible that has to do with holiness. And so I just begin to learn about those things. I watched my grandfather go into his prayer room and pray and come out and say the Lord said he's going to send somebody by with a, with a blessing for us today and it wouldn't be five minutes somebody knocked at the door and said the Lord told me to bring y'all some of this and he said praise God the Lord told me you were coming oh I didn't need a superman I'm looking at granddaddy like God told you that was going to happen the phone would ring one of those phones that has a wire connected to the wall and he would say somebody called they're they're sick they're on their way to the hospital there's something bad happening i'm going to pray and he would go and i could hear him praying in there he'd come out in a little bit and the phone would ring again and said we turned around and headed back home the prayer's been answered god has moved on our behalf how do you not have a hero of faith that walks with god like that 
And while I love my dad and I love my mom and there's revival that came into our family a few years after that and they're serving the Lord and we're all on our way to heaven. It was a traumatic time in my life. We used to have a Bible on the table and now there was beer. We used to hear preaching against tattoos and now my dad was getting them. It was a total different world. What did I know as a seven and eight year old boy except my grandfather has a stable walk with God and a stable marriage and a stable home and he doesn't play with dice or wear a watch. So what did I do? If that's what it takes, then it must mean that wearing a watch brings you closer to getting a divorce. I just wanted to do everything granddaddy did because I equated every behavior with a law that would save me from repeating trauma. Are you with me this morning? Pharisee said, if we don't spit in the dirt, if we don't mess up the Sabbath, if we make our prayer blankets bigger, if we make the boxes that have scripture, phylacteries, on our forehead and on our hand, Jesus said, you enlarge your phylacteries and prayer shawl, bigger prayer boxes, bigger prayer shawls. You, you, you think all of these things will earn you the coming of the Messiah. He said, these are not helpful. You tithe on mint, cumin, and anise. You leave off the weightier matters. It took me a long time to realize I, I, didn't wear, I did not wear short sleeve shirts from the time I was in fifth grade until I graduated Bible college. In Orlando, Florida, I, I mowed the yard in long sleeves and pants. I swam in long sleeves and pants, only with guy cousins, not with, you know, not that mixed business, not, mm -mm. Why? Because I thought, if I keep the rules my grandfather keeps, I won't know the trauma that happened in my past. Now, look at the Pharisees that say, we want the Messiah to come. Get holier so the Messiah will come. Live cleaner. Now they're rule, they're not just rule keepers, they're the Gestapos, they're the police of the rule keeping. They're going through villages. You put down that bed. Well, I was healed and the one who healed me told me I should carry my bed. Who told you to carry your bed? Like, somebody says he might be the Messiah. Well, let's see what he does. Oh, he healed on the Sabbath. That's not the Messiah. He doesn't wash the, the cups. He doesn't, his disciple. That's not, he's not keeping the rules. Listen, when you begin to worship a system instead of a savior, then the people that need a savior that are breaking your system become the enemy, your enemy, and you begin to attack them instead of helping them to fall in love with a savior that they have need of. Now, if you're hearing that Robert is some kind of hyper grace, live however you want, then you don't know me. I still believe in holiness under the Lord. I still believe in righteousness. I still believe that his name is Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. I still believe on the miter of the high priest that said holiness under the Lord. I still believe he is a God who is a thrice holy, 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 sfunt, sfunt, sfunt. I still believe in the holiness of God, but... You and I are not holy in ourselves. And you can cut all the oranges off of an orange tree and you can tie 10,000 apples to its branches. And if that's all that we do with religion is teach the system, dress right, act right, stop saying that, don't drink that, don't smoke that, don't go there, don't do that, put down the dice, take off the watch, do this with your hair, do this with your sleeves, do this. And we don't find that if you don't make the root and the tree good, then it will not change the fruit on the branch. Then we have worshiped the system and we have not introduced a dying world to a savior that is the only one who can make them holy he makes us holy from the inside out and he said the motive of our holiness must be this if you love me keep my commandments hear me he did not say if you keep my commandments I will love you because he already loves you In a, in a three mile radius of this building there's somebody shooting up right now I don't need the gift of prophecy to know that there's somebody who got drunk last night and beat on their wife and Jesus loves that person just as much as he loves you he is the, the zenith the apex the most high level of agape unconditional love 
He can't love you more because you obey him more. But he says, if you love me, let love be the motive of your obedience. Your obedience cannot earn you anything. It is not a paycheck. A paycheck is the opposite of grace. Zechariah says, Zerubbabel, you've been tasked to rebuild the temple. But there seems to be a massive rock, a mountain of opposition between you and the calling on your life. He says, but I prophesy to that mountain, you will become flat like a plane. And when you are finished building this temple, you will be able to look at it and say, it wasn't by might nor by power, but it was by the spirit of God, which you could not earn or deserve. So you will have no other conclusion but to say, grace, grace. Um, I need, I need, brother, would you, brother Seth, would you go get those two things in the, in the hall? There's two rocks right out there in the hall. Quickly, please. Hallelujah. Here you find a Pharisee and a Sadducee. And they said, this guy claims to be the Messiah, but he's breaking our rules. Hear me. They're not, they're not trying, you know, just hold on to him. Now that you got him, just hold on to him good job yeah I'm glad I picked the I picked the right guys you know what happened somewhere in these men's life their grandparents said if we want the Messiah to come we got to keep all the rules and their parents said if we want the Messiah to come you better add to the rules and be even stricter and their rabbi said work harder and they became the proselytes of other Pharisees and said here come on Jesus says you put heavy weights on them grievous to be born if you want to please the Lord lift it higher if you want to please the Lord work harder you have to strain don't you know living for God it's hard to live for if you're not sweating while you're praying you're not praying hard enough if you're not losing your voice you're not praying hard enough if you're not if you're, you, you don't even have on a suit and tie and you claim to be pleasing to God and you listen to music other than hymns and you know what religion says shame on you shame is not the same as guilt guilt says you broke a rule and that action was wrong repent of that action receive forgiveness and move on but shame says there's something desperately wrong with you they saw they were naked and they were ashamed and they hid from the one who was coming in the cool of the day to clothe them with the righteousness of a lamb. If the church casts shame, we prevent people. Is it hurt yet? No, no, not yet, not yet. You're, and t see, if, if, if it doesn't hurt, then God's not pleased. Don't you know that's the way this thing works? If it's not hard, then it's not really worship. It really, you know, when you really suffer bad things, that's when you know you're pleasing to the Lord. How many know there's some people, that's the way their religion works? The heavier it is, the harder it is, the more God likes you. Come on, start sweating, and then God will still really, really start loving you. So you have Pharisees, and they said, he claims to be the Messiah? but he's breaking our systems. And they find a woman caught in the act of adultery. In the very act, do you think they gave her the politeness of time to get dressed again? Thrown at his feet in the sheet of her own sinful act. They said the law of Moses says she is to be stoned. You know what I have found to be a principle of life? Look this way if you hear nothing else this morning. We treat others on the outside the way we treat ourselves on the inside. When you find someone screaming at a waitress, at a cashier, you know what they're doing? They're really taking out the poison that is so toxic in their mind and their heart on someone else. You know what these men were doing? You got this. Come on, you got this. You know what these men were doing? They were saying, I'm trying my best and I'm not feeling the help of Messiah. And it must be their fault because they're not trying as hard as I am. I wish I could, you know what, I've messed up and so maybe if, I do, maybe if I work harder, God will be pleased and it'll make up for my mistakes. The reason they wanted to throw stones at others is because they were throwing stones at themselves. Notice this, listen, I'm almost done. Somebody help me on the piano, please. 
He was not saying, you're almost done. You're almost done. <laughs> you're not even sweating. Listen, thank God for air conditioning. Listen, okay, you can put it down. Hold it just for a second. But don't put it on the floor. See, this is what we do in church. I can do more than he can do. I'll lift more chairs in the youth group than he does. <laughs> I'll sit on the front row and I'll scream in tongues louder than everybody else. Did she notice how long I screamed in tongues? Praise God. Paul says it's not wise to compare yourselves amongst yourselves. They're looking for any way to get rid of the heaviness. They weren't, they, listen, they did not come to stone the woman. It was a trick. They were trying to stone Jesus. And when they said the law of Moses says she's to be stoned, what do you say? Oh, I can't wait till we get to heaven. We get to pull up the video and see what he wrote in the dirt. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he wrote let the, the numbers one through ten and their minds hearken back to when the, rem, the rabbi when they were boys said one and they said love the Lord your God with all your heart mind soul and strength two do not take the Lord's name in vain three have no other have no graven images four honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy five honor your father and your mother six seven eight nine and as maybe he maybe he's just reminding them of the law I don't know but the picture of what he's doing is a powerful message. You claim she's dirty? Let me show you what a Messiah does when he finds people dirty. He gets in the dirt with them. He puts his message in their mess. And religion cannot stand to accuse you. Hell cannot stand to condemn you when a Savior stoops down to lift you up by the power of his word. He rises up again and he says, he that is without sin cast the first stone. See, the only way the law works is if you keep it, all of it, all the time, 100%. That's why Paul writes to the Galatians and says, why are you going back to that? You never kept that to begin with. We never could. By faith, you become a child of Abraham who received righteousness by grace through faith. And the Bible says that from the eldest to the youngest, I don't want to hurt the carpet or the ground, but you can put those rocks down. From the eldest to the youngest, but those men didn't care about the carpet. Can you imagine rocks beginning to hit the ground? No, no, no. Imagine if you're the woman and you were expecting at any moment they were about to hit you. Rocks big enough to kill somebody are now thud, thud, thud. And they begin to walk away. Can I submit to you today that that woman was not the only woman rescued in that moment? But those men realized a gospel of grace says, if we don't have to stone her to get rid of this weight, maybe it means we don't have to stone ourselves. Maybe it means the Messiah will not come by earning him. I would like to believe that the gospel not only sets people free from drugs and alcohol and perversion and, and, and adultery, but the gospel sets people free from systems of religion of men. Come on, I know the Bible says pure religion and undefiled is this, that you take care of the widow and the orphan. There is right, holy religion, but there's a whole bunch of man-made religion and all it does a weight that they carry around all their life. And on the outside, they say, pache. But on the inside, they're saying, I can't believe she's wearing that. On the outside, they're saying, pache. On the inside, they're saying, you don't sing the way I do. You don't come to the altar as much as I do. You're probably not even doing what God wants you to do. You know what's so powerful to me? Religion makes us suspicious of one another. But it's only because we're actually suspicious of ourselves. Will I make it? 
Am I as saved now as I was the last time I prayed for God to forgive me? Is God still pleased with me? God, God, I want to be on your side, but I don't even know if, you're, if you still love me. And so I know I've messed up, and if that means you're against me, then that must mean the position of God is to be against people. And so if I'm godly, I have to be against people. And we find a reason to take a stone and say, shame on you, shame on you, shame on you. Is there a mountain between us and what we will be in heaven? I am not as holy as I will be in heaven. And there is a mountain of condemnation and assault from hell that says you can't have revival. You're not as holy as Paul. You're not as anointed as Smith Wigglesworth. You're not as powerful as David Wilkerson or Billy Graham. Look at the mountain between you and the call of God. And you know what the answer is? Grace! Grace! I want to be holy, but not to earn revival. Revival comes by the grace of God. It's not a paycheck for how long I kept my hands up and how loud I preached. Oh, oh thank you, Jesus. Y'all can be seated. Robbie Grubbs was here with me last time. And on the last Sunday night of that service, I'm being very transparent with you. We drove back to the hotel. I begin to sob. I'm not talking about a tear. I wept. Robbie said, what's the matter? I said, Robbie, it's exhausting. I don't want to offend their culture. I don't want to say something wrong. I want the pastors to be pleased, but I want revival to come. I, I'm navigating cross-cultural ministry. I'm reaching for a generation with the pressure and the weight of generations of religion. Good-meaning grandparents, good-meaning pastors, pastors that came out of prison cells under Ceausescu that from the trauma of the past said, if you'll do like this, and if you'll worship like this, and if you'll stand like this, and kneel like this, and dress like this, we won't go back to the trauma that we face everybody is trying and it's so heavy and it's so hard and when I landed this time I told my friend who's with me I said I have to do I have to, I have to operate different all I know to do is obey God and step back and say it is the Lord's work and it is marvelous in our eyes my work will not bring what God wants to bring. I cannot fill people with the Holy Ghost. I can't preach loud enough, hard enough. All I can do is obey. But he says, if you obey me, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. God's not waiting after every song to say, you didn't sing that note right. He's not waiting after every sermon. <laughs> I have had so many people in Romanian churches, God love them, they had good intentions, meet me at a back door. I have PTSD in every Romanian service that somebody's gonna grab me at the back door and say, you know, you shouldn't have said this. But you know what? They didn't wake up that morning trying to be the villain. You know what they're hoping? If we get things right, we'll earn revival. I'll never be 100% perfect. But he says, I give you grace for grace. You can let down the stone today. You don't have to stone yourself anymore. And you don't have to rule, use your rules to push others away from our great Savior. Will he change their life? Absolutely. Do we need pastors to say, hey, young people, if you love the Lord, we, we don't do this. We don't go there. We don't drink that, absolutely. But the core issue is even if they don't do all the don'ts and they do all the do's, you'll never earn him. It's the free gift of God. The Lord would say to you to get today, grace on you. Is that not what we prayed for Zipporah and Ruth? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord give you peace. Stand with me to your feet if you would please. Y'all are welcome to stay all day, but I'm hungry and I have to go eat. But if you're more hungry for the Lord than you are food, you're welcome to stay. Would you, would you just look at your neighbor and tell them grace on you?
grace on you. Grace on you. I've heard people say Cristo Sandiat like it was a threat. But I've also heard people say it because they were glad Jesus was alive. I have seen people say Pache like they were in the mafia ready to bury me in their backyard. But I've also seen people say it because they know the prince of the Pache, the prince of peace. And they say it saying, I have received peace. Freely I have received, freely I give. Go free. Go free. Now go. Listen, when Jesus looked at the woman and he said, where are those thine accusers? You know what I saw on your face this morning, Brother Joe? Grace. Pastor from Springfield, you know what I saw? I almost leaned over to my friend, but I didn't want to interrupt. I said, he's, I thought he's got a little bit of a, he's got a little bit of a smile in the corner of his mouth when he's preaching the word. I love that. You know why? Because as a boy, I thought when you preach, you had to look like this. And sometimes I do look like that. But do you think that's what Jesus looked like when he looked at the woman? Where are thine accusers? You know what he or she would have said? You kind of look like one. Hebrews says Christ is the express image of God. If we are to seek the face of God, what is on a face? An expression. What is the expression of God? The face of Jesus that looked at her and said, where'd they go? The enemies accuse some of you so many times. It's an echo inside of your life. You're bad. You're messed up. You're broken. You failed. You're trash. You'll never be any good. You'll never overcome the stains. This is what's wrong with you. This is why your children act that way. That's what's wrong with your marriage. You'll never have the ministry, the anointing, all of the accusations. Like a, It's more than a rock. It's a mountain on top of you. And Jesus wants to come to you today and say, where is it at now? Because when you look in his face of grace, all of those accusations drop their stones and walk away. He did not say to her, you are go free. You are free to go back to your bed of sin. That's not what he said. He said, go and sin no more. Can I submit to you, if you see the face of God's pleasure for you today, you will have more power to overcome temptation than if you walk out of here and say, I have to try harder. I have to lift a heavier weight so God will be pleased. That is a weakening, exhausting thing. I don't know if I'm going to get on a plane tomorrow or Tuesday or when. I don't know how long this revival is going to go on. But whenever I'm able to get on that plane in Seattle and fly, I refuse to be weighed down, feeling the pressure of my performance. Performance. At 38 years old, after being an evangelist for 16 years, I still have to look at the face of God and say, I don't feel like I performed well enough to deserve you. But God, could you smile at me again so that I know I've received the spirit of adoption? Hallelujah, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Would you lift your hands today all over this room? The Spirit of God is ministering freedom. Not freedom to go back to sin. Not freedom for compromise. But freedom to love Him. Grace on you. Grace on you. Grace on you. Let the shame melt off today. Right where you are. Let the shame melt off of you today. So what are we supposed to do, Brother Robert? Are we supposed to preach against earrings or say it's okay? Are we supposed to preach against women in pants or say it's okay? Are we supposed to preach against makeup or say it's okay? Hear me. You know what I love about the Romanian community? You still have the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord says, you don't come casual. Now, if they come casual, Pastor, in shorts, we can still give grace to them. But when they learn as Jacob prepared his family and said, wash yourself and put on new clothes. We're going to Bethel to meet with God. We learned that we don't approach him casually, but the nicest Armani suit will not earn you his presence. So what should we do? If that's the question you're asking, you don't understand that the answer to that question will not bring revival. Give him your best. Listen to the leadership. Whatever church you attend, whatever church is watching online, if your pastor said head coverings, wear head coverings. I'm not preaching against it. 
When I go to Romania, I don't get up in their churches and say, you don't have to do this or have to do that. You know why? Because where there is no standard set by leadership, there's no fear of the Lord. Don't fight your leadership against the standard they set. For them, it is not legalism. For them, it is trying to set the fear of the Lord in your heart. So you don't come in some Led Zeppelin t-shirt and say, I'm a Christian and I can do whatever I want. No, come submitted to the leadership of the house, but know the finest clothes will not get you in his presence. It's grace. It's the work of the Lord. I really, mm, Sunday mornings, we don't always give altar calls and so I want to be sensitive to the Lord. If you know the person standing beside you, women with women, men with men, or unless you're married, if, if you're married, then you can do this. Would you take somebody by the hand? A brother with a brother, a sister with a sister, unless you're married, then husbands and wives, you can hold hands. I'm saying that so boyfriends and girlfriends don't hold hands. You know what I'm saying? Girls with girls, boys with boys. Would you grab their hand? You know what we're going to do right now? Instead of you coming to the front and waiting for a, a minister to lay hands on you and say, shame, go in the name of Jesus. What if the body ministers grace to one another? What if you're not suspicious of the person beside you? Well, I know how my husband lives. I know how my wife talks. But what if instead today you give them grace? grace to believe that their prayer is as powerful as any minister in this house with that hand next to you I don't even have to ask people to lift their hand if they need grace I don't need the gift of prophecy to know they need grace you need grace I need grace in your home watching online every person on that couch they need grace in the sound system our babies in the nursery they need grace don't wait for them to come to the front and get it you speak Paul God, Moses said to Aaron you pray the grace of God on them and you know what the Bible says when you pray this in my name I myself will give it to them Come on, can we take a moment and give grace to one another? Begin to pray for the person on your right and your left. Grace on you. Grace to go free from condemnation. Grace to go free from the accusations of the enemy. Freedom from condemnation. Free from, freedom from the weight. Freedom from the pressure. Freedom from, freedom from the anger. Freedom from carrying the rocks to be thrown. You don't have to stone yourself. You don't have to throw rocks at yourself. You can go free. You don't have to throw rocks at others. You can go free. Hallelujah. You can live holiness under the Lord, but you can only do it by the grace of God. Grace on you. Grace on you. Lord, silence the accuser of the brethren today. Silence the lies of hell over our lives today. Silence the suspicion of religion today and cause your voice to announce freedom in Jesus name where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty not liberty to sin but liberty to love Jesus liberty to know the smile of your Savior liberty to know the grace of God on your life go free go free go free and whom the Son hath made free is free indeed hallelujah Thank you, Jesus.